In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The word of God for our consideration today is taken from our gospel, Mark chapter 1, beginning with the fourth verse. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, some things are necessary, others aren't. Is it necessary that I prepare my own taxes? No, there's other people who actually get paid to do that. But I do it because I like to see where my money is going and that way I also don't have to spend the money on somebody else that I, for something I can do. Is it necessary that you brush your teeth? Well, you can live without teeth, I suppose. But you probably are helping yourself to keep those pearly whites free from embarrassment. And probably your family and friends thank you for not walking around with perpetual dragon breath and driving everybody out of the room. Some things are necessary, others aren't. But what about when it comes to spiritual matters, spiritual necessities? Is it necessary to go to church every Sunday? Well, usually, somebody who asks that question comes at it from a point of either spiritual laziness or looking to ease a guilty conscience. What about when it comes to baptism? Is baptism necessary? The thing with baptism nowadays is there is some confusion. Some people look at baptism as nothing more than a nice ceremony that they go through to proclaim to the world that they are Christians. Others don't see much benefit to it at all. And so others, we see it as having power, having blessing, having the ability to create and sustain faith. Well, this morning, as we study God's word together, we're going to look at the subject of baptism, both Jesus' baptism and our own baptisms. And today we're going to see that, we want to see the necessity of baptism, both for Jesus and for us. Now, our lesson this morning takes us back to the Judean desert, Maybe you even recall before Christmas hearing a portion of this lesson as it was one of the readings during Advent. It takes us out to the Judean countryside along the Jordan River's edge and there we see John the Baptist preaching a message of repent because the Savior's coming. Get ready for him. The people came in droves to hear him. From Jerusalem, from all the countryside, people went out to hear this camel-haired, garbed hermit preacher who was known for something other than just eating an interesting diet. They went out to hear John preach. And that word was hitting home. But of all the people that came out, there was one who didn't fit the same profile. And of course, that one is Jesus. So listen to our lesson today and we see what the difference was. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John made the crowds aware of their sin. He made them aware of their need to repent of those sins, their need to confess those sins, and their need for forgiveness. But Jesus? Jesus didn't fit that profile. In fact, the Apostle Peter tells us he committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. Jesus had absolutely nothing to confess. He had no guilt to carry out there. And so, in a sense, he had no need for this baptism to come confessing his sins, to be forgiven of those sins, because he had none. And yet, there was a necessity for Jesus to be baptized. Again, our lesson tells us at that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. If you look at the other gospel accounts of this lesson, you see actually John the Baptist kind of putting up a hand and saying, Jesus, hold on. You don't need to do this. You're the Son of God. You're perfect. You're holy. You're without sin. Why would you come out here confessing sins that you don't have? It should be the other way around. You should be the one baptizing me. 
You see, as, as powerful a preacher as John was, he recognized something still. He knew Jesus was the one whose sandals he was unworthy to untie. He knew that he baptized with water, but Jesus was going to be baptizing with the Holy Spirit. He knew that Jesus didn't really need this baptism for himself, and yet even John didn't get the whole picture. What Jesus was doing with this baptism was proclaiming his solidarity with sinners. He was taking his place alongside sinners, showing himself to be their brother, showing himself to be the sin bearer. And so for Jesus, yeah, there was a necessity for him. There was a necessity for him to bear that sin and to identify with sinners. When you look at that baptism, I said at the beginning of the service, it's kind of like Jesus' inauguration. And at this inauguration ceremony, at this commissioning ceremony, you see all three members of the Trinity active. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love, with you I am well pleased. The same spirit that caused Jesus to be conceived in a virgin mother is the one that now we see descending on him, equipping him with power, anointing him for this service. Think back to the Old Testament lesson where God had called Jesus before he was even born, anointing him, setting him aside for this special work. And now we see Jesus anointed by the Holy Spirit. Then that voice from heaven, heaven ripped open, and that voice proclaiming, You are my Son. With you I am well pleased. All the work that Jesus had been doing thus far, he had been living in obscurity in Nazareth with his parents, his mother and his stepfather, being obedient to them. Fulfilling all of God's laws up to this point. And God says, I'm, I'm happy about that. And now this work of the Savior that you're about to undertake, I am so pleased with you for that. The Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all in agreement, all working together for this plan of salvation. You know, when you think about all that we know about Jesus, everything that the Bible says about him, it's a wonder that there is still such confusion about Jesus. You know, you listen to the secular world and you sometimes even listen to Christians and it makes your head spin of what they come up with. Jesus ends up being sort of this cross between Greek mythology, Marvel comics, a social justice warrior. They'll call him holy, but what they mean is that he talks about spiritual things to make life better. And if that's all we see Jesus as, then we're kind of missing the point of who he truly is. We're not listening to what the Bible reveals about him. Well, what about us? You ever sell Jesus short of who he is? Do you ever look at Jesus and say, you know what, what the Bible says about him, eh, maybe he's not quite there. Or maybe I simply don't give him the credit that he rightly deserves for everything that he does. You know, when we listen to the secular world, it really takes the glory away from who Jesus is. It takes the mystery and the majesty away from him when we don't credit him as being true God robed in human flesh. When we take away from him that Jesus, actually true God, had such an interest in you and me that he would come to this world to be our Savior, to take his place alongside of us as our brother. Now this baptism, even though Jesus didn't need it for the forgiveness of his sins, it was necessary. It was necessary because he needed to align himself with us to show us he came to be our substitute. He came to be the world's substitute. 
He came to be the world's Savior. And when the Holy Spirit anointed him with power and authority, when the Holy Spirit anointed him, supporting him, and God the Father gave his approval, that just tells us for sure. This wasn't some person striking out on his own with his own ideas in mind. This is the Trinity working together to carry out the plan of salvation. You think back to that Jordan River. And it's obvious for us now to see why Jesus needed to be baptized. To let us know he was beginning his work of salvation, to letting us know that he is indeed our Savior. But what about when it comes to us? When it comes to our own baptisms? How necessary are they? You know, you look at those people that were coming out to the Jordan River, and which one do you identify with? Well, Jesus had no sin to confess. So like it or not, we need to find ourselves, identify ourselves with those who came out confessing their sins. People who had fallen short of the glory of God. People who recognized that their life that they lived was not in keeping with what God had in mind for them. But do we admit that? Do we always admit that our lives are not what they should be? You see, we, we might look at our baptism and we look at what God did for us. He claimed us as his own. He made us his children. But the fact of the matter is we don't always live in that baptismal grace. We don't always live the way that God expects us to live. And even when we put our trust in him, even when we believe about baptism, that it's the power of God for salvation, that it gives the forgiveness of sins, that it offers us new life. Still, Satan knows how to turn the screws on us, doesn't he? You see, Satan will point us back to the issues that we have in life. You might call it our addictions. What addiction do you have? Maybe it's to drugs or alcohol. Maybe your addiction is to that digital screen that you spend so much time on every single day. Maybe your addiction is to passing judgment on everybody else. Maybe your addiction is losing your patience. Maybe your addiction is having to always be right, no matter what the expense. You see, we feed ourselves on these addictions. And they're not simple character flaws. They're not simple whoopses. These are really making these things into our God and making ourselves unacceptable to Him. We like to downplay them. We like to keep them secret. We like to say, well, they're not really as severe as you're making it out to be. But they are. You know, we laugh about the addiction of cell phones and digital screens. I just saw this week that people are comparing it to being addicted to cocaine. It does the same thing to your brain of using a screen like that. That can be qualified as an addiction. And so we look at these things and we try to say they're not that big a deal, but what they do is they separate us from God and separate us from his presence. They separate us from his mercy. They separate us from his grace. God wants us to come with those crowds, confessing those sins, confessing those addictions, laying them at his cross and saying, God, I cannot do anything about it, but you can and you have. That's why Jesus went into the Jordan. That's why he allowed those waters of baptism to rush over him that day. It was because, not of his sin, but because of your sin and mine. He stood in those waters to take his stand beside us so that all of our addictions can be placed at his cross and be forgiven. Because at his cross he did battle with our addictions and he conquered them. At his cross, he, he freed us from Satan's hold on us. At his cross, he conquered death and even hell itself. And then just a stone's throw away, after three days in a tomb, 
He showed himself victorious for you and me. Jesus needed to go into the waters of baptism for you and me. And when it comes to us, we need those waters as well, don't we? Because what it does is connect us to him. It connects us to Jesus. It connects us to his sacrifice. It connects us to all the benefits that he's won for us at his cross. All the benefits that he's guaranteed to us through his empty tomb. You and I need those waters and we need them so that we can have that forgiveness and that assurance. There are some things we do because we like to, other things we do because they're necessary. Jesus necessarily had to go be baptized. For you and me, baptism is a necessity. Think about it, if you are a parent and have children that are not baptized, look at what you're missing out on. Look at what they're missing out on. If we withhold baptism from someone, we're withholding that assurance that should something happen to that little one who's unable to confess a faith, we know that God has worked in that child through the waters of baptism. And if you're older and have not been baptized, well, look at what you're also missing out on. God giving you the assurance, here you have the forgiveness of sins, here you have life, here you have salvation. And for those of us who have been baptized, even if we don't remember the day of our baptism, cherish that baptism. Even if you haven't thought about it in a while, look at the promises God made to you put his name on you and claimed you as his own. He said, you are now my child and I will never take that promise away from you. You have the forgiveness of sins. No matter if you walk away from me or not, I always hold out that gift of forgiveness to you. I have won salvation for you. It is in heaven assured for you. And he's also giving each one of us new life. New life to live for him. New life to live in that baptismal grace. And what that means is saying no to those addictions more times than we say yes to them. It means putting them down and when we do fall into them, we put them at the cross. You see, Satan likes to tempt us. He takes us down those old familiar ruts, those old demons that haunt us day after day. And he also gets us to strike out new paths that lead away from God. But God says, take each one of those addictions, whether it's an old one or a new one, and lay it at the foot of the cross, and you know it is forgiven. God grant you his baptismal grace that he has assured to you in those waters. May you live always for him, assured of your salvation. Amen. Please stand. Now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you always. Amen. We now join in singing our next song.